Good morning and welcome to St. John's Church on this third Sunday after Epiphany. Our first hymn is number 409 in the hymnal. Please stand if you are able. continues on the top of page two in the worship booklet. Blessed be the one holy and living God. Glory to God forever and ever.
rather the collect of the day, which is in the Sunday news. Jesus, our Redeemer, give us your power to reveal and proclaim the good news, so that wherever we may go, the sick may be healed, lepers embraced, and the dead and the dying given new life for the glory of your holy name. Amen. A reading from the book of Nehemiah. All the people of Israel gathered together into the square before the water gate. They told the scribe Ezra to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had given to Israel. Accordingly, the priest Ezra brought the law before the assembly both men and women, and all who could hear with understanding. This was on the first day of the seventh month. He read from it facing the square before the water gate from early morning until midday, in the presence of the men and the women and those who could understand, and the ears of all the people were attended to the book of the law. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was standing above all the people, and when he opened it, all the people stood up. Then Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting up their hands. Then they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. So they read from the book for the law of God with interpretation. They gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra, the priest and the scribe, and the Levites, who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat, and drink the sweet wine and send portions of them to those for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord, and do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks be to God.
reading from the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians. Just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. Indeed, the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot would say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear would say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many members, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the members of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And those members of the body who think less honorable we clothe with greater honor, and our less respectable members are treated with great respect, whereas our more respectable members do not need this. But God has so arranged the body, giving the greater honor to the inferior member, that there may be no dissension within the body. But the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together with it. If one member is honored, all rejoice together with it. Now you are the body of Christ and individually, individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then deeds of power, then gifts of healing, forms of assistance, forms of leadership, various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? But strive for the greater gifts. Hear what the Spirit is saying. Our gospel hymn is on the second page of the Sunday News, and we will sing it twice. Please stand if you are able.
Holy Gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee, and a report about him spread through all the surrounding country. He began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. O God, may your word be spoken and may your word be heard. Amen. Please be seated. In the passage from Nehemiah, we heard that all the people gathered in the square before the water gate in Jerusalem, and they heard Ezra the priest speak, read from the Torah, the book of the law, from early morning until noon. That's a long time. Other priests helped the people to understand what they were hearing, and the people were so moved that they wept. Imagine that. In the Gospel, Jesus went to his hometown synagogue and was given the scroll of Isaiah. He found the passage from Isaiah chapter 61. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me and has anointed me to bring good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free. Jesus' sermon is very short and to the point. Today, as you hear these words, they have come true. And the people were amazed. In both stories, people gather to hear the scripture. Of course, most people would not have been able to read, so the only way they would experience the sacred text would be by hearing them read out loud. But we also know that the spoken word carries power, more so than private reading. We carry on this tradition today. Even though most of us can read, we listen in worship to words read out loud. And the reading is a community event. Hearing scripture is a shared experience that shapes the whole community. But here is another point. In the coming together as a community and in the hearing of sacred texts, people stand at the juncture of past, present, and future. In Nehemiah, the returned exiles have spent years of hard work to reclaim the land and rebuild Jerusalem. They have suffered famine, attacks from nearby tribes, and even oppression from their own leaders. Finally, however, the walls have been finished and they gather to hear scripture. They heard words from centuries earlier about the deeds of God to their forebears and both the promises of God and the expectations about what it means to be God's people. They learn their true history and they understand that they have gone astray. They have neglected to love and serve God as they ought to have. And this moves them to tears. They heard the past. They reflected on the present. 
and they were moved to want to change their behavior, their relationship to God in the future. The gospel also captures this transitional moment that connects past, present, and future. Jesus in his hometown reads this powerful passage from Isaiah, the servant song, that speaks of the one who will come to heal, give hope, and provide freedom. The one who will support and encourage those who come back to a ruined land to rebuild the cities and replant the fields. And at the time of this prophecy, they were probably talking about these returning exiles that we heard about in Nehemiah. But Jesus, in his brief message, claims that he is the one promised by Isaiah. The past prediction has come true now. And in his day, there's just as much need for healing, freedom, rebuilding, and replanting as in the time of Isaiah. And because Jesus is the one who is promised, nothing will be the same in the future. This is the launch party of Jesus into his ministry, and the congregation is transfixed, at least as for, at first. Wait until part two next week. Scripture provides the grounding of our faith. It is the touchstone that requires us to constantly return, to hear it once again in our present context, to interpret it anew as the word of God. You don't get to read scripture once and then you're done. And yes, scripture is complicated, and yes, some of it's inconsistent and even contradictory. So having some historical and literary background is helpful. But even without that, it's important to read, listen, pray, and ponder scripture. And it is best done in community, hearing different people's understanding and interpretation. We are faced today with so many challenges we need this spiritual substance from the word, not just to make us feel good about ourselves, but so that we have the courage to face our past, to live in the chaotic present, and to move towards our future. I've recommended that the Vestry and Search Committee read the book, The Church Cracked Open, by the Reverend Stephanie Spellers because she talks about the moment in history that is now in our church, the Episcopal Church. I've been reading it myself, and some of it is a really tough go. Chapter four starts with these words by Frederick Douglass. The church of this country is not only indifferent to the wrongs of the slave, it actually takes sides with the oppressors. The author writes, Douglas's words aren't, weren't directed at a particular church, but they could have been. No church in the United States of America compares to the Episcopal Church for longevity and depth of alliance with colonial imperial power. For much of America's history, this particular branch of the Christian fold, she means us, has energetically cooperated with, provided theological cover and blessing for, and received wealth and privilege from systems of colonization and white domination. Our beloved Episcopal Church, she says, is steeped in the blood of indigenous people and African slaves. She goes on to give us a number of illustrations. She writes first off of the Jamestown settlement in 1609. Men setting sail for Virginia first took an oath of allegiance to the king and the Church of England. One of the first structures built at Jamestown was a crude worship space. And she says that people were expected to show up to church up to twice a day. She goes on, Anglican faith was at the center of the Jamestown enterprise. 
But she notes that Jamestown settlers would not have survived at all without the generosity of the Powhatan Confederacy, 30 tribal communities in the land around the settlers. They gave them food and, and direction. And yet, when drought struck, the tribal communities realized they didn't have enough for their people and also the settlers. And when they told the, the Jamestown leaders, they decided to declare war on the defenseless indigenous people. Even when they said, why are you waging war on us? Because we've been just giving you out generously from what we have. Nevertheless, their pleas fell on deaf ears. Leader John Smith declared war on them, unleashing a terrible violence with the goal of annihilation. Spellers writes, look closely at this blood-filled sea, at white settlers collecting the heads of indigenous women and children and receiving tribute from the British commanders. Look to the leaders and governors like John Smith who made the call to enact irregular warfare, theft, and genocide. You will find behind them the Church of England. That is our heritage. That was our start in this land. And it doesn't get much better after that. How do these words sit with you? What are you feeling in your body? It's hard to stomach, isn't it? It makes me actually want to throw up. And it's not just about the past. It is who we are now because we have been part of this system of wealth and privilege and oppression connected all the way back. Like the people in Nehemiah, I want to weep, and I feel like putting on sackcloth and ashes. And yet, Jesus says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me, who has anointed me to bring good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free to declare the Lord's jubilee year. While it is clear that Jesus came especially for the marginalized, the poor, the sick, the imprisoned, we know that he also reached out to the rich and those in power. He also offered to them the way to life. What has been well documented is that white privilege also imprisons and destroys white persons, as well as black, indigenous, and people of color. We cannot be free and whole until we face our past and use our energies and our wealth to set things right. All of our lands, our suffering, and our cities and our society need to be rebuilt. The message of Isaiah through Jesus is for us too, but it means it's not an easy letting us off the hook. It means we have to do deep, painful work and allow it to change us. But Jesus promises to walk with us in this path and to supply courage and to bring forgiveness. He shows us just what it will take because he walks the path and suffers and is transformed. That is what we also are called to do. In the Vestry and the Search Committee retreat, we ended with a reflection on a passage from the Gospel of Mark. And I was blown away by the depth of insight and the level of sharing. So I know that this congregation has it in view to do this kind of reflection. 
I attended the Zoom coffee hour last week, and once again I heard people musing on scripture and sharing openly their life struggles. And I know that there is a faithful men's Bible study every week on Wednesdays. I encourage you to keep this up, keep dwelling in the word, keep reflecting on your and our past, keep hearing God in the present, and use this to shape our future. We can do this, and we must do this. So let us pray. Gracious Holy One, you come to us in the creation. You come to us in the word of scripture. You come to us in the lived experience of, of those in our communities. Continue to open our hearts and our minds to your leading, to your lively scripture, so that we may reflect and understand and be transformed by your word into the people you want us to become. We pray this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen.
for all those in danger and need, the sick and the suffering, prisoners, captives, and their families, the hungry, homeless, and oppressed. Lord, have mercy. For the dying and the dead. Lord, have mercy. For ourselves, our families, and those we love. Lord, have mercy. For earth and its intricate web of creatures that supports all life. Lord, have mercy. For all in our hearts whom we name silently or aloud. We pray for Charlie, Norm, Cecily, Rosemary, Sarah, Marjorie, Ernie, and Lynn. We remember Sheila Jones, Candy Connolly's sister who died this week, her husband Bob, and her son Eric. Remembering the Blessed Virgin Mary, John, and all the saints, let us offer ourselves and one another to the living God through Christ. To you, O Lord. O God, who sent Jesus among us, hear the prayers of your people and make us into new wine for the glory of your kingdom. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The peace of Christ be always with you. And also you. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and sacrifice to God. God be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. We give thanks and praise to you, O God, the one in three. 
one in wisdom as you created all that is, one in goodness as you spoke the word of life to your creatures, one in blessing as you saved us from sin, evil, and death. That we have failed to love you as we ought, we acknowledge, good judge, pardon us. That we have not served your people, we confess, good shepherd, have mercy on us. That we do not resist evil, we repent, good savior, deliver us. We bless you for strengthening us by the witness of our ancestors, by the blood of martyrs, the constancy of exiles, the fortitude of prophets, the holiness of life of those who have gone before us. We bless you for giving blessed Mary and John and all the saints as our companions at work and at table. We bless you for armoring us with light for the work of justice and for encircling us with your constant love. And so we raise our voices in the endless hymn of praise we share with all the saints and with angels and archangels as we sing.
gifts of God for you, the people of God. Lord Jesus, you give us yourself and the bread and wine of communion that becomes your body and blood. Grant that we are physically, whether we are physically present in the church or are at our homes, that we may receive you spiritually today in our hearts, minds, and souls, and that we may have confidence in your promise to be with us always. Amen. Eternal God, giver of love and power, your Son, Jesus Christ, has sent us into all the world to preach the gospel of his kingdom. Confirm us in this mission and help us to live the good news we proclaim through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Holy Eternal Majesty, Holy Incarnate Word, Holy Abiding Spirit, bless you now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Our final hymn is number 72 in the hymnal.